so if this is beyond bullying, understanding the ripple effect of biased based incidents, we talked and touched on a little bit of that in the last session and how to mitigate the harm that comes from when does bullying become something more than the behavior we've come to know. So we are very lucky that we have uh, Carla, Chenault, Carla Chenault from the director who is the director of education at ADL of Michigan and Carolyn Nor Normaden, I hope I got that right, who's regional director for ADL of Michigan. So they're gonna walk us through um, what we need to know today in this this next hour. So Carolyn, Norman, Carla, floor is yours. Thank you so very, very much for, for being with us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am Carolyn Normandin. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for everyone here at Defeat the Label. And we'll give a shout out to our friend Jamie from Defeat the Label. Um, I think it's significant that we're talking today. Today is the anniversary of the shooting of a, a Tree of Life. And so ADL is a, a, an unapologetically Jewish organization. We're going to talk a little bit about what we do to fight anti-Semitism and how we connect that to fighting bias and bigotry. Uh, I'm Carolyn Norman, the regional director of the Michigan office, and my uh, colleague, a strong educator, Carla Schnault, who is our education director. Um, so we're going to jump right into it, and Carla is going to bring up some, some slides. And um, I think pictures were, are worth a thousand words sometimes in this. So we're just going to talk right about it. Um, let's just go to the first slide. So it's important for us to level set everyone. And why are we here and why is ADL called upon uh, to do things like this? Well, we're an anti-hate organization and we're a civil rights organization. So we were founded in 1913. It's more than 100 years old. Our mission has always been single mission to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and secure justice and fair treatment to all. Um, and I think it's really important that we talk about that because the founders of ADL knew that if we didn't fight for the rights of everyone, no Jewish person would be safe in a world where no one else was safe. And by uh, the same token, if we only fought for other groups and not the Jewish community, the Jewish community wouldn't be safe. I think it's particularly poignant, as I said, that today is the fifth anniversary of a time where a white supremacist went and shot up and was radicalized on, online and shot up a synagogue. And this is the fourth anniversary of that. So I think it's really important, our topic today. Let's uh, And where bullying comes from and how it escalates. So we are, I always tell people, we are a mission-driven organization and we are informed by research. And what I mean by that is, um, we on the left side of the screen we investigate and research and that's how we collect data we've been collecting this data for more than 40 years and that's how we inform the idea the idea the uh ideals that we have so the data that i share with you today is real data from real sources and it's not um i want you to understand that it reflects hate crimes data that it mirrors all the other data that and from the Southern Poverty Law Center and the FBI and the ACLU. And so we, we feel very strongly that our data is, is really great. Um, so we add, investigate, we educate, and we advocate. So let's start on the right-hand side. Advocate is just exactly what that sounds like. We go to the halls of Congress. We go to state legislatures. We advocate for straight, stronger hate crimes laws. I will say that tomorrow is the anniversary. I think it's the 12th anniversary of the federal hate crime statute the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. federal hate crimes law. And that was partially authored by the ADL. So it's an important day for me because I think it protects for, for those people who are in states that don't have any hate crimes law, the federal statute of course protects them. But our sweet spot is education and training. And that's what Carla's gonna certainly talk a lot about that. We train more than a million, uh, 1.5 million students a year in our state alone. This in, during 2022, um, this organization, the Michigan office, has has worked with more than a thousand teachers, which is really important. You're all educators, so you understand the power of having information at your fingertips because. You know, with students, the student graduates, they might leave and they might carry that information on to a college or a university or a trade school, but they're gone out of the school, whereas this, the educators remain. So let's go to the next one. 
So anti-Semitic incidents have been growing and growing and growing. And over the last year, the last several years, you see in this bar chart, last year was the single largest number of anti-Semitic incidents in the country since we've been collecting this data. This is really important. For more than 40 years, this is the single highest number. In Michigan, our numbers have been going up steadily and also has, has was the highest number uh, in, since we've been collecting. So let's go to the next slide. So this kind of tells the Michigan story. So you see in 2017, there were 61 incidents. In 2020, in, I'm sorry, in 2019. In 2020, it was during COVID. So there weren't as many um, incidents of, of vandalism or assault, but you can see that the incidents of harassment online particularly grew exponentially. And as people got really, really fearful and, and tired of the pandemic in 2021, we had the largest number of incidents. Um, by state, the map on the left shows the story also. This is a very dubious club to be in, folks. Um, the yellow indicates the states that have the most incidents, more than 40 incidents per year. Michigan had 112 incidents per year of anti-Semitic incidents. Actually, 263 incidents were called in or reported into our office. Roughly half of them, about 140, were anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish in nature. We took out the duplicates, we do not count duplicates, and we ended up with a number of 112. The reason that number is significant is if you look to the other states around us, Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, Minnesota, we all have, we have more than those. We over-index on anti-Semitic incidents in our state. The state we tie with is Texas, which is a much larger state, much larger population than Michigan. So this is something that's worrisome. So where, do this, where does this come from? We, this is so important to us that we have um, a, a booklet called Anti-Semitism Uncovered, a guide to old myths in a new era. And I'm gonna ask Carla to put that in the chat when she has a moment. And I'm not gonna go through all of these incidents, uh, all of these tropes, but I will uh, direct you to a few of them. The booklet that Carla's gonna put the link into um, is actually uh, goes through it in these different chapters. And, and it's very helpful, they're short chapters. It's very helpful to read where this kind of stuff comes from. I'm gonna pick a few of them. The one on the very left, the, the common stereotype of power or Jewish power, the idea that Jewish people own the banks, own Disney, own the media, or it's just about the Jewish power. That really can be traced back to more than 150 years ago to the eight, late 1800s um, to a Russian conspiracy group that, that put together uh, a, a, a Russian group that put together a conspiracy called The Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. This is a real book, and it tells the story of a secret meeting, a cabal. Does that sound familiar? A cabal secret meeting about world domination, taking over the power. Completely fabricated meeting, completely fabricated book. In fact, that book was debunked as a complete fake more than 100 years ago by a, a, a university professor in Great Britain. This thing never happened. And yet, the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion has been printed and printed and printed. It was printed by Henry Ford. It was printed by the Nazis. And it's it, and it's the playbook right now in our country on many, many chat rooms and white conspiracy uh, platforms and white supremacy platforms. Another one I'm going to bring your attention to is the idea of Jewish greed. You see that as the third one from the left. Please take note of that guy's face, the big nose, the eyes, the saggy face, the money. That is, again, this idea that Jewish people only care about money. It started to take shape um, in like, you know, in the early Middle Ages, when Jewish people were not often not allowed to own land, so they went into the merchandise business, or they, um, they were tax collectors, so they became hated. I mean, who doesn't hate the tax guy? Um, and so this idea that Jewish people were surrounding themselves with money came out of there. And then the third one I'm going to call out is the blood libel. That's the one that's third from the right. This is an extremely prevalent anti-Semitic trope 
a trope is just a myth or a story. This came from the 11th century. A monk named Thomas Manamuth was trying to come up to quell the concern in the small little town that they lived. he lived um, because there had been a mysterious death of a Christian child. We don't know the, the boy could have fallen out of a tree. He could have had a heart attack. He could have had an aneurysm. Nobody knows why this boy died. But Thomas Monmouth came up with this idea that Jews must have killed them because Jews use blood in their rituals. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Jewish people don't use blood in their rituals. They certainly don't use the, the blood of Christian children. They don't harvest organs or any of the other shenanigans that is covered by the blood libel or the idea that Jews bring disease or any of that. So those are just three of these tropes. You're going to see them as we go along. Let's go to the next slide. Well, you see two of you see two tropes in the middle on the on the right hand side. Um, you see this Black Lives Matter, this sort of oafish, big gorilla type person, um, black person um, with a caricature of a black person, caricature of the 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 happy merchant, the guy with the big nose. The idea that Jewish power is is kind of infiltrating the lives of people. This is a current meme that's up there. People ask me all the time. Why do these myths get promulgated? There are three main reasons, I think, for the rise in anti-Semitism and other forms of hatred. And I have a colleague at ADL that says anti-Semitism doesn't always start with the Jews. It always comes back to the Jews. So things like the COVID-19 pandemic completely started focusing attention on the Asian community, wrongly so. The idea that Chinese people brought COVID-19 to the shores of the United States, completely wrong. And yet it got promulgated on the internet. It got motivated by social media. Um, the political and social environment that we find ourselves in, people don't like what each other is saying. They have differences of opinion about masking, not masking. Okay, so I'm going to call the person I disagree with a Nazi. Um, that kind of sort of infiltrated into our, our common language or our normal language. And the third reason is disinformation or misinformation. Misinformation is when I make a mistake, I quote something wrong or I give you a figure that I, that I somehow have mistaken. Disinformation is the willful promulgation of wrong information, information you know that is wrong, that you send out there that is part of um, becomes part of the pop culture. And you see the picture of Kanye West. We could have a whole entire hour on Kanye West and what he said recently, what he doubled down in him saying, and actually how his rhetoric on internet with 31 million followers and all the merchandise that surrounds him and him calling for violence against Jewish people, you can see how that kind of sticks and people get radicalized. Go to the and and we're going to go to. I'm glad we're on this. We're going to stay on this, but I'll make a point that when things happen in the community, that's when it trickles down into schools. And so you as educators are finding these kinds of things popping up in the language and thoughts of young students who may not even know what they're talking about, who may not even understand the word anti Semitism. So ADL came up with something called the Pyramid of Hate. And this is a large, uh, like sort of a foundational uh, ID, idea that ADL uses. And the idea is at the top of the pyramid where very few people play is genocide. That is the real heinous killing. Darfur, um, Mar um, Miramar, um, you know, the Holocaust. Um, those kind of willful ethnic cleansing kind of thing. Most people, play in the biased attitudes. And this is often unintentional. This is where we have the best opportunity for making people understand and rethink their ideologies. This is general stereotyping, insensitive remarks, microaggression, um, screening out positive information, going for negative information. When left unchallenged, it this kind of attitude turns into acts of bias. This is where you see bullying, ridiculing, name calling, social avoidance, epithets, uh, anti-Semitic or racial slurs, belittling jokes. We, we see that that happens also with young people and, and people of all ages. But, and if, again, if not challenged, it goes into the yellow part, part of the 
pyramid. That's systemic discrimination. That's where you're starting to get sort of real uh, construct in society, wage dis disparities, voter restrictions, voter suppression. This is very dangerous territory. This is where we are in this country right now. Um, and if you don't challenge it, it also can rise and go into bias motivated violence. And that's where you see the incidents in increasing in real violence. So let's talk about violence and crimes. So one of the things I was asked about is uh, the fact that um, uh, this is where uh, the difference between a hate crime and a hateful incident. Um, and I'm surprised because there's there would have been a picture on this slide. Um, one of the pictures would have been um, swastikas on a uh, cemetery. A crime has been committed when somebody spray paints tombstones on a on on uh, spray paints a swastika on a, on a headstone. That is a crime, and it's been committed. A hate crime is when a crime has been committed, and the person was that was targeted was targeted because of their ethnicity, their races, their race, their religious, their gender identity, their religion, their gender identity, their characteristics. That can include institutions, you know, dry, drawing a you know, swastika on a building of a synagogue. Drawing a swastika or painting on somebody else's property is a crime. It's vandalizing, vandalism. But when you draw it on a re religious institution and you're drawing an anti-religious thing like a swastika on a Jewish synagogue or a noose on a black church, that's when you see the real uh, intention, the intentionality of a hate crime. So if um, if you saw a picture of um, you know, swastikas on a tombstone, hate crime, a crime has been committed, and it was intentional towards Jewish people. Kanye West speaking about, you know, what his, his anti-Semitism on the internet is not necessarily a crime. It is free speech. In this country, we have the First Amendment guarantees us free speech. And this is really tricky because free speech and hate speech are one and the same, as long as it doesn't breed an action, a so Kanye West can talk about, you know, his anti-Semitic remarks and his rhetoric, but when he incites people for violence, that's when it crosses the line. Um, Oliver Wendell Holmes, a, a former Supreme Court justice, once famously said, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. That means you can't make something happen, make an action happen that will harm people. The Supreme Court has upheld harsher penalties due to the ripple effect of um, of uh, hate crimes. Um, so they have stiffer penalties because of the ripple effect. And we're going to talk about that. In order to prove a hate crime, you have to prove targeting because of race, ethnicity, identity, or beliefs. Let's go to the next slide. So the ripple effect. What this simply means is a ripple in a pond. It has more rings. It continues to, to move. The reason hate crimes are have the ripple effect is because they target more than one individual. If I'm standing there with three other Jewish people and somebody targets me for um, a, a slur about my Judaism and the other three Jewish people hear it, it targets them as well, even though I'm the person that's hearing it. If somebody is targeting a Black person and says, I want to lynch you, and there are three other people of color standing there, it hits them the same way, even though they weren't the original target. That's why the ripple effect is dangerous. It can impact an entire group and it can have a chilling effect on the entire group. Next one. So why is it important to take care of this in schools? It, many reasons, but let's talk just about four of them. First of all, even when there's consequences for the person who did this, the person that's targeted is often overlooked. It People tend to concentrate on, okay, we suspended this child or this child has detention or this group is no longer on the swim team, but nothing happens to the person, nothing happens proactively for the person who has been um, affected or targeted. And let's not, let's be very clear on this. Having the person who's been targeted explain their feelings 
to the people who did it to them is not a good idea because that also targets them. So you have to come up with a creative way and make sure there's contrition to be able to, to be able to take care of the needs of the person that was targeted. That's number one. Number two, consequences for the group. And you see a group holding up their hands in a Hitler salute and they were all suspended, okay? But their friends are could all, if they don't understand what the significance of a Nazi or Heil Hitler salute is, then they say, well, it's so unfair. So-and-so can't be on the basketball team because he did this. Nobody really even cares about that. The consequences can be misunderstood if the whole school or the whole group that witnessed it doesn't understand the significance of it. The others around the target are often ignored. I, I talked about that in a, mi a minute ago. And then the most important thing is transparency on why this is wrong is with the way to get to the learning moment. So I'm just going to share with you very quickly a case study. Meet Cheryl Thomas, the school principal of Linden Middle School. She, her students are the ones in the, in the top picture. Now, ADL does not come in with pitchforks and torches to schools. Um, and in fact, most of the time, if an incident is reported to us, unless it's in the media, we don't talk about it. We deal with it with the school. Carla has had many counseling sessions where with a, a school administrator or a teacher or a guidance counselor that's trying to wind, you know, navigate their way through an incident of hate. And nobody even knows about it in the public because it has not become public. Once it becomes public, then we do speak out. And Cheryl, we contacted her after a member of the media sent me this picture. And all I did that day was say, dear Principal Thomas, you don't know me. I'm with the ADL. I'm giving you a link to a booklet. Take a look at page 18. You'll see how to deal with a Nazi gesture. If you want to talk to me, you can call me. And she did very quickly. Over the weekend, me and my, my colleagues talked with Principal Thomas several times. By Monday, she had a plan and she put her entire middle school, the sixth, the seventh, and eighth graders through a curriculum that was designed by ADL to talk about why it's wrong to do Heil Hitler. And now she's continued that work. She's had, uh, her school is going for a no place for hate designation. Carla's going to tell you all about it. This is a picture of her in the bottom uh, corner. It's a picture of her speaking at the Michigan Hate Crimes Conference. She speaks publicly about this incident and how it shaped her school and how she dealt with it. I would love, if there were was an Olympic award, I'd give this teacher, uh, this principal, an award for handling something quickly, understanding what, why it was important and making sure everyone in the school was level set and continuing the work. And now they're working on other things. It doesn't always have to be biases and always against the Jewish community. Obviously there's racism, there's homophobia, there's, you know, anger and, and, and uh, against Asian people or Hispanic people, you can fill in the blank and hate breeds hate. And when people don't understand it, particularly young, young people, you get in, into problems. Let's go to the next one. Okay, um, I think that's Carla. Okay, Carolyn, thank you. Um, and I wanna apologize to you. I couldn't get your resource in the chat because I was afraid to stop, you know, I didn't know how it was going to impact the sharing the slides. So if you want to do that now, um, then, you know, that resource can be shared. So thank you for, for being patient with me. My name is Carla Chenault, and I'm the Education Director at ADL Michigan. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how ADL Michigan tries to help schools mitigate some of the harm when we have um, biased incidents. And we know that um, in a perfect world, we, we wouldn't have to deal with it, but the truth is that we have incidents and we want to be able to help our students through them. So ADL's education um, content, we have a lot of great resources, curriculum um, and lesson plans that we make available open source to educators. We are, those, those resources are built on a framework that has four pillars. Uh, the first thing we like to do is always start with identity because we know that this is a place in this work that we all can live. We can all get on uh, this journey when we start with exploring our own identity and then coming to understand others, right? So that we're interpreting differences and appreciating one another's differences. From there, we try to move into the space of bias, understanding what it is, giving students and educators language so that they can talk about it. 
um, so that we can challenge it if it needs to be challenged. And at the end of the day, we want to be champions of justice. And I know from some of the teachers that we just heard from, there are lots of great programs that are going on and a lot of positive things that are happening in our schools. Needless to say, we believe that diversity is a strength. And again, we live in the space of bias, as Carolyn talked about with the pyramid of hate. It's those biased attitudes that we really want to target and address. And the truth is, we're all biased. So there, yeah, this is a universal understanding. It's something that we all share. The good news is, you know, because it's learned, it can also be unlearned. And that's why we live in this space of challenging bias so that ultimately we can make some changes. And yes, change is a process. So it's something that we, we, we get up and, and attempt to do on a regular basis. The other thing that I like to point out about the work that we do, and I know that I'm preaching to the choir, as they say, is that this work is synonymous with the work that we're doing in the SEL space. Right. This is social emotional learning work when our students feel completely valued and 100% and whole for who they are and all of the ways that they identify. That's when you're going to get greater self awareness. You're going to find that students can manage themselves better. You're going to build healthier relationships. And we've heard some of that come from the teachers that spoke already about some of the things that are working in their in their communities this idea of everybody having an adult that they know well right so building those relationship skills and becoming more socially and emotionally aware and the work that we do uh, informs that work as well so i wanted to share with you today some of the resources that we have and some of the the strategies that we try to share uh, to help um, mitigate some some of the harm. One of the, the resources that Carolyn is going to put in the chat is called Zero Indifference. And this is a, a, a resource that I often share with educators. And it speaks to this idea of, of you know, not having the luxury of being indifferent. Um, and there are three things that we, you know, strongly want, you know, want to avoid. And what are those things? You know, ignoring the incident. You know, Lynn earlier in the program when the social worker who talked about, you know, what we do when we when we're frightened or when things scare us, we, we can either freeze or we can, you know, fight or, or flight. And and when we get in these incidents, sometimes we as educators, the adult in the room, we may not know what to do, but we're encouraging you to do something. Do not ignore the incident. Do not excuse the incident, which we've already talked about. And uh, try not to, to the best of your ability, allow yourself to be mobilized, with, to be immobilized by fear, even though sometimes it can be a, a frightening thing, especially nowadays with everything being recorded and with social media and that kind of thing. Um, but the more you can, you know, gain these strategies and practice these strategies, then the, the more productive you can be. So there are two things that we want to remind you of. And that is that you have to stop the behavior immediately. So when you're seeing things that you know are inappropriate or students are doing things that are hurtful to others, we have to stop in and, and, and stop the behavior. And then if we have the capacity, you know, thinking about all of the trauma that we're all negotiating on a regular basis, if we know we have the self-awareness and the capacity to deal with the situation on the spot, then and, it, and it's appropriate, then that's what we would recommend. If not, then find time to deal with the incident and correct the behavior at a later time in a private setting. None of these situations are exactly the same, and we realize that. And, and, and if they were, it would, it would be easy, right? We could do one, two, three, and it's solved. And it doesn't work that way. So we, we do say that you know every situation is different, but here are some things you want to think about. You always want to think about the needs of the targeted student uh, or student. Um, Carolyn spoke a little bit of, about that, right? We want to appreciate that even if the intent wasn't to be harmful, there is and is oftentimes harm, harmful impact. You also want to think about the time that you have to really address the issue. If you're running from class to class or you know that something's about to happen, the bell is going to ring, maybe you decide to, to deal with the incident later on when you can sit down and really you know unpack things 
the location of where things happened. Was it public? Were there other people there? Was it private? Is it something that you can, you know, just deal with one on one? The age, of course, of the students that are involved. And then we talked about this earlier. Is this an isolated incident or is there a pattern of bullying, right? We know that those are slightly different. So understanding the context of how you want to move forward. We have another resource that is very helpful that I like to share with educators. It's called our Incident Response Guide. It's a digital resource, and I know Carolyn's going to put a link in the chat. It looks like this, um, and it is very helpful, and I like to share it. When I first started at ADL, I was really excited to see it because when I was a building administrator, I wish I had had access to something like this. One of the things that we talk about is, you know, in a perfect world, trying to prevent uh, incidents like this from happening and certainly uh, from becoming public. Um, and then to be prepared, like the incident that uh, Carolyn talked about with, with Principal Thomas at Linden Middle, you know, being prepared to have, you know, what you're going to do should, should you need to, to act quickly. Um, one of the things that is going to be important to think about, and I know that there was a question asked earlier to the teachers, do you have policies in place? You do want to have policies in place. You do want to have a mechanism where students and adults can report uh, incidents if if things are happening, right? Where they're going to feel safe and they can report and know that something's going to be done. You want to act quickly and have a response. Um, you want to communicate. That transparency is very important, right? Getting the narrative because if you don't, you know, you run the risk of somebody else creating the narrative or for misinformation to to. Uh, to, to move forward, and that's never helpful. And then at the end of the day, we want to be educating. We are schools, we are educators, and we want to heal. Um, so the other uh, bit of information you'll find in this guide is sort of the tips you know, for intervening it, when you have to. And we've talked a little bit about this, some strategies for de-escalation, I think were brought up along the way today. But we have six simple strategies I quickly wanted to share, you know, assuming good intent, but making sure we're explaining impact, asking a question sometimes, oh, what did you mean by that? To kind of diffuse a situation, interrupt and redirect. Sometimes it helps to broaden to the, to the universal. Oh, are you saying that all people do that? And then correcting that level of thinking or make it an individual situation. Oh, yeah, I know that so and so is always late, but that doesn't mean everybody is. Or simply, ouch, that hurt. And so those are some some simple strategies that we can even teach our students that 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 help to kind of react in the moment in a way that's not too difficult. And then the other piece of the guide that is very helpful is how to turn some incidents into teachable moments. And so if you have the guide and, and I hope that you're grabbing it out of the chat, um, and I know that Jamie will send these resources after today. Um, you'll find that on page 16, we have a, a, a series of uh, anti-Semitic in incidents that can be uh, looked at. And inside the book, you'll see the historical context of why uh, the Heil Hitler salute, like we talked about in the example at Lindy Middle, is, is, is not okay. And helping students understand why that is. There's discussion questions that you can go through. There are additional resources that you can look at. Same thing with racist incidents, the N-word, nooses, why we don't compare you know, African-Americans to, to monkeys, right? Why that's not okay. And I know that kind of thing is happening because I meet with schools and it's surprising that that these things do happen, but our students don't always know, and we have to teach. And then, of course, we have uh, resources for you know anti-immigrant bias, anti-Muslim bias, anti-LGBTQ bias, ableism. So that's a really good resource, and we'll make sure you get a copy of that. Last but not least, I want to speak about our school climate program. So I've heard a couple of the teachers today name some things that they find are really working, and I think that's great. One of the teachers is in the West Bloomfield district. We are currently working with West Bloomfield. West Bloomfield Middle is using our No Place for Hate, and so is Swan Valley Middle. So it was, I was happy to see that uh, those districts have Teachers of the Year. I'm going to quickly show this video on the No Place for Hate program. Place for Hate makes my campus a more friendly and enjoyable place. It's created a climate of respect and compassion that we can be very, very proud of here. I think No Place 
is for each to be a core subject in every school. If we don't know how to take care of our peers, then how are we going to build the next generation? So No Place for Hate is ADL's signature school climate program. It's a national program and there are schools across the country that are designated No Place for Hate. Um, what makes it unique is that it is a student empowered program. So the work is really coming from the students, the student voices, um, and, and it's a framework. So if your school is already doing uh, Defeat the Label, or Positivity Project, or Leader in Me, or the other you know, programs that I've been hearing about today, you can still be a No Place for Hate School because it's a framework that kind of you know, puts an umbrella around the work that you're already doing. And the idea is what we're talking about today, making safe places for our students, combat, combating bullying bias and, and uh, bigotry. So how do you become a No Place for Hate School? Well, the first thing that we tell schools is you need to have a student committee because this is student work, even at the younger ages. We want the committee to be uh, run by students, voiced by students. We want to hear from them, kind of like what we heard today from Jennifer, who surveyed her students. And I heard another teacher say that they're giving the students you know, the opportunity to run the clubs. We need to get our students seen and heard, and we need to get their voices around this work. And that's what this program does. So we start with a student committee. We encourage them to do a survey of their peers. From there, we have encouraged them to do a school-wide pledge event. And again, school-wide. So all of the students, educators, certainly involve parents, if that makes sense. As many people that know what you're doing, the better. Our pledge is very accessible. We have an elementary school and a middle school and high school pledge. And we're simply saying, you know, and, and, and striving to be people who will promise to do our best to treat others fairly, for instance. Or if we see someone who's being hurt or targeted or bullied, we're going to let an adult know and, and so forth. From there, a, a school will allow their committee to plan three activities. They'll have the school year to do the activities. Um, the idea is that those activities then are going to reach their peers so that the learning takes place across the school uh, community and that all of the students are included and uh, involved in the learning that we're talking about, educating on these things. And from there, you get to celebrate your success. And it was funny because in the panel discussion, we ended with celebration, didn't we? We ended with what are the things that are positive? And the great thing about the No Place for Hate program is at the end of the year, you celebrate. You get a wonderful banner. I don't know if you see the big banner behind me, but that's an example of the kind of thing that your school will get. And it's a great way to say this is who we are and this is what we believe. We have a, lots of schools across Michigan. We have about 40 schools now who are registered for No Place for Hate. Waterford uh, Mott uh, in Waterford, Michigan is our longest running uh, Michigan No Place for Hate school. They've been in No Place for Hate school for 13 years. And um, what I love about the comment here is that 13 years, you know, it's not that incidents have completely gone away, but it has created a self-awareness in students and a place to uh, talk about uh, how we can grow and be and be more respectful of others. We have a website with lots of information, so we'll drop that in the chat for you. And I'm going to wrap up with just sharing a few of the other opportunities that ADL uh, has has for educators so that you know that we are sincere in our in our interest in partnering with you. Uh, we do workshops for educators and for students. So these are students that we did a race symposium with them in Plymouth. We've done PD with uh, educators in Plymouth. We have uh, anti-bias uh, anti curriculum guides at all grade levels, elementary, middle, and high school. And these guides are really wonderful for, for finding lessons that you can do in your classrooms. We also have uh, an, a digital course. We've partnered with EverFi. Uh, it's called Benai, Bena, excuse me. And it's uh, for high school students, and it talks about a contemporary anti-Semitism, what it is, 
and what we can do to be better allies for people who identify as Jewish. Uh, on our website, our education uh, pages, you'll find you know, a long list of uh, wonderful books that you can choose from. We have what we call Table Talk, which is um, sort of a blog that we do on a regular basis that gives you tips and strategies for Table Talk conversation with parents around the dinner table. Uh, you can see a couple examples of what we've done in, in the last few months. And then you get support from ADL. So I'm the education director here in Michigan, but we have education directors across the country. And our jobs are to partner with you and to provide all of the resources that we have so that you hopefully will have what you need to address some of what we've been talking about today. So if you are interested in getting on our mailing list or finding out more about some of what I've shared today, uh, please use the QR code that's on the slide. I think Carolyn's gonna put a Google form uh, link in the chat and we appreciate it. We appreciate this opportunity. Jamie, thank you so much for inviting us to speak today. Carla, Carolyn, we appreciate both of you being with us um, today. And um, so we have questions for you. So Carla, if you can kind of bring your screen down. So the first one, Carla, I'm going to throw it back to you because the question came in is, so how does the ADL confirm that schools are meeting the requirements for No Place to Hate? Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. So we manage the No Place for Hate program through Canvas, the learning management system. So once a school registers, uh, registers to be No Place for Hate, then we invite them into the Canvas course. And from there, that's how we communicate, you know, pictures of your pledge event, pictures of your first activity, ideas from me, resources that you might need. And that's how we follow along. And then come May or June, when those, um, you know, designation items have been met, then we designate you no place for hate school and we celebrate. Celebration is the biggest part of that. I remember when bullying prevention really started when I got into it back in 2003, 2004, the whole thought of having students run things was such an alien idea. It was like, no, 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 we have to do it. We have to do it. And we get like the teachers were talking about, we get so many great ideas just from our students and they want to make the change. So I want to also let you know that Marcus, who is at Howard University, wants the ADL to know that the black community stands with the Jewish community because You've had our backs, we have yours. Thank you both for being here and what the ADL does. So I wanna jump back up to uh, David in Scarborough wants to know if anti-Semitism uh, focused incidents has been increasing over the last three years, kind of what is the cause of the sudden rise? And while I'm reading this and I was listening to you, it was really, I was thinking about what Lynn was talking about earlier about the whole pandemic. And then we got into this thing about people just have this need they just say what they feel do you want me to take that one carla okay so um adl has been as i mentioned has been tracking information for more than 40 years and there have been dips towards the early part of 2020 uh, 20 2000 we had started to see a decline in anti-semitism it started to ramp up um roughly five six years ago and it got a big push after Charlottesville. Charlottesville was this Unite the Right rally. There were many white supremacy groups uh, that showed up there. Some of them rebranded themselves, splintered off. Um, and there, we, we think there are three main reasons. Number one, um, it went largely unchallenged by some leaders and so sort of started to get more uh, momentum. Social media has been a catalyst. And um, and when you when you are on social media, you can call like minded people to yourself. And so it came up from the sort of the sewers. And and I would say it's not just anti-Semitism. I would say it was all hate. So we started to see a significant rise. One thing we do know about anti-Semitism, it's been around for millennia. I mean, since two since this since the Catholic Church started blaming Jews for the death of Jesus. That That's early, 2,000 years ago, okay? You see that when people are fearful, they look for someone to blame. And often, Jewish people were right there as a target. 
Anti-Semitism is often called the canary in the coal mine. And as I said, one of my colleagues says, anti-Semitism doesn't always start with the Jews. It ends with the Jews. So if you take the case of the global pandemic, something that people had no control over, looking for someone to blame because they don't want to say it's the chaos of the universe. I mean, there was a global pandemic 100 years ago. We all know that. Um, but with this little device, people can call like-minded people to themselves. And so instead of stand and look at ADL as a civil rights organization, we believe fully in freedom of speech. But when you go out onto a public square and you get on a soapbox and you do your freedom of speech, you can you can reach the people around you, maybe 10, maybe 100 people, maybe 200 people. But this little device allows you to amplify that and send your message right. around the world. So we know that this is an acceleration tool. It's also a brilliant tool because you can look up blood libel and say, what is that and why? Where, where did it come from? So this is a powerful tool and like powerful tools, they can be misused. So that's one reason. The other reason is this sort of us versus them mentality, particularly in politics. This is not just in Michigan. It's not just in the United States. It is worldwide. And you've seen as people are fearful and looking for targets, finding the Jews or finding the Asians to blame against, you know, for COVID and then quickly turning on it and saying, okay, it's a Jew's fault because they want to make money on the on the um, the vaccine, that kind of thing. And the other thing is we've seen a rise in conspiracy where because, again, because of this device or, or platforms that don't tell both sides of a story, when you take a conspiracy, you take a kernel of something and then you expand on it and you add fuel to it. And all of a sudden it takes on a life of its own. And we see that over and over again. And it's really difficult to dismantle a conspiracy because you start to bring facts to it and people say, oh, but that's what they want you to think. It's very, very difficult. So what is needed here is rational thought, real information and challenging. Carla did it beautifully when she talked about, you know, some of the strategies of saying, hey, what are you talking about? Or where did you get that information? Or, you know, because I think that's really something that that especially educators need to do. Um, it, there are other reasons for the rise, but really the rise of social media, unfettered social media, no right. guideposts. And then, um, and then disinformation and misinformation, conspiracies, and of course the political climate. And I think part of that also goes into what we were talking about with the artist currently under fire is I, I heard a rabbi on the news the other morning talking about they really need to talk about the issues and address the issues that are coming from that, not allowing the person to to have you know more of that kind of pulpit to talk. And that Julie from from Boca was like, that's hard to deal with with students um and some have said you know he's mentally ill but is that just good, giving an excuse for somebody when what you're saying is you need to talk about the roots of this the causes and how do we overcome those i think you're you're absolutely right and we're talking if, if we're talking about um kanye west which i think we are um we're talking about a person who has 31 million followers right and merchandise, and beloved music, and um, people that have grown up on music and care about the artist. You can separate the artist from what the artist has said. And what the artist has said, calling for violence against Jewish people, calling for violence against anyone, yeah. is not acceptable. So taking apart um, you know, one of the old ways of saying it is you love the, the hate, the sin, love the sinner, right? Mm -hmm. But realizing that taking a person with such influence and such power and what their words said and how they're using them to incite violence against somebody, not acceptable, never acceptable. And there's your answer. <laughs> is dressed to that. Um, this is a really interesting one from Nancy in Carlsberg wants to know if the school had an older incident and people didn't address it at that time, um, they didn't feel like they wanted to respond to it. Uh, can they backtrack and address the issue? Or is that something, you know, they have to wait till something else happens so that they can really address it? Or should they go back and address something? 
Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, if I'm a school administrator thinking about that, um, I don't know that I would necessarily go directly back to the incident and try to unpack it again, because I don't know contextually what has changed, who in the community is still there. But if I know that it happened, I can pretty much surmise that it's happened before and it'll happen again. So I can take a proactive lens and say, these are some issues that we're going to discuss in this community. These are some ideas that we're going to educate on in this community so that hopefully we can mitigate uh the harm and uh, uh for for future right yeah let's kind of take that absolutely. let's take that sign post and put it on the wall yes absolutely so I, I i always told my kids it's never too late to do the right thing and i agree yeah. with carla completely i mean she's our education director so i always defer to her but talking about anti-semitism and where it comes from or talking about swastikas or or um uh, uh it's calling somebody a nazi or or talking about a noose in general, not to say talking about the incident where the noose was left, but why is it not okay to leave nooses? Why is it not okay to do, you know, uh, Heil Hitler's? And why is it not okay to target somebody uh, because of their ethnicity? That I think is a very general thing, and that never goes out of style. And yeah. thinking too about, you know, I've been sharing with the educators that I've met with in the last few weeks, you know, Halloween is often a time where we see, you know, students making poor choices, right? So yeah. talking about that in advance and, and reminding them the importance of, you know, what, what you're using and your costumes and how you react and so forth, it matters. Yeah. Um, and that kind of went into Brianna from Boulder also was, uh, even though Tree of Life was a synagogue and the shooting in Charleston was at uh, Emmanuel at, at African, African Methodist Church, those were both targeted events. You know, they're both biased events. So um, I, even though they're different religions, they still fall into that that bias category. So for her, it was good for her to ask that question earlier while you were going through this. That's um, really, really important, Kevin. What was that person's name? Uh, that was Brianna. Brianna. Great, great analogy. You see radicalization and it, it the 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 majority like 95 percent of the shootings the killings the murders in our country are at the hands of white supremacists and white supremacists hate black people hate jewish people hate hispanic people hate asian people uniquely that is one of the characteristics the one of the things they share in common so whether it was Christchurch mosque in new zealand whether it was ame church in uh, north carolina tree of life El Paso, Walmart, it doesn't matter. The, the ideology, the promulgation of the hate is usually it, in this country, the domestic terrorism is at the core of it. And the thing that is in common is that they hate all people who are non-white European. That's, that's at the core of it. Um, so you can take those analogies and see how they're being radicalized to hate the other. And that includes, of course, members of the LGBTQ community, you know, the Pulse nightclub. They're all, it's all, it's, it, it's all the same extremists. Right. Yeah. So go back on a positive note. So for Carla, last question, <laughs> and we'll kind of wrap this session up is uh, Betty in Birmingham wants to know, can we partner No Place uh, for Hate with other anti-bullying programs like Defeat the Labels, Upstander, or something else? And how do they mesh together? Yeah, that's a good question. I appreciate that. Birmingham, you're on my list. So hopefully we'll get a chance to meet. Um, but yes, I mean, no, no Place for Hate is more of a framework because a lot of what schools are doing already fall within the bailiwick of what, you know, we, we, we are deeming um, No Place for Hate activities. So if you're already doing these kind of activities, then this is a great way to kind of celebrate, make it visual. We do banners, we do wristbands, you know, we have, you know, cell phone. Um, you know, pockets, that, that kind of thing. Um, we have schools uh, that do No Place for Hate that also do Positivity Project. Mm -hmm. 
and they use positivity project for the daily. They right. use no place for hate to go deeper. So absolutely, um, it can be done. Jamie and I are going to meet next week. We're going to have lunch. We're going to talk about the schools who yep. do defeat the label and talk about how it dovetails with no place for hate. So absolutely. And I'd be happy to talk more about it. Okay, great. Communication, collaboration. You know, we come at it all from different angles and, and use all the information we can. So, Caroline, Carla, we thank you both for being here. We thank you for what the ADL does, not across just Michigan, the United States, globally, how you reach out. So, thank you for all the materials that you gave everyone here today. And I think we are going to move into a very quick break to get our next presenter all set up. But thank you so very, very much for everything you, you do and what you've given us today.